Well, we kicked off a brand new series last week called Overflow, and we're wrapping it up this week. And the the whole focus of this series is to take a look at generosity and how it can impact our lives in such a positive way, as well as the lives of others. Last week, we talked about how money fills our lives with stuff, but God fills our hearts with satisfaction. And if you missed that talk for one reason or another, I, I'd encourage you to go back and get caught up with it because it is a short series, but there's a lot packed into it. This idea, this reason that we're taking time to focus on generosity is an important one. And the reason it's important is because money and what money promises is the chief competitor for your heart. One of the first times that this registered with me was during college. Now, while in college, I was basically a minimalist. You know what that is? That's somebody who doesn't have much. And it wasn't by design. I know some of my classmates were minimalist, you know, those people by design. Not me. It was by the lack of cash flow. I had just what I needed to get by. Money was tight, but I did fine, and it really wasn't a problem for me. I had a job as a freshman, part-time job, where I cleaned in the graduate school building. And then as a sophomore, I got a great job. I was the driver for a blind piano tuner. It was awesome. It was a great job. And these jobs gave me just enough money to put gas in my car, pay a little bit on my school debt, and then buy the occasional burger and fries with my friends, or in Cincinnati, the occasional three-way and cheese coney. One day, though, a classmate of mine was in need of a few bucks, and he came to me and he asked if he could borrow $20. Now, I rarely had $20 on me at that time, ever. And let alone did I have $20 I could loan to somebody, but it just happened that he caught me on a good day, and I loaned him the money, and he promised to pay me back very soon. Several weeks went by, and I thought, this guy, any day, he's going to come back, you know. He's going he's to stop by the dorm room and pay me the 20. But then I started noticing that he was avoiding me. You know, I'd see him and he'd go the other direction, you know. And then the semester ended, and it dawned on me, I'm never going to see that $20 again. And i got to be honest with you, it made me mad. <laughs> yeah, I, really, I started to resent this guy. You know, all because of $20. $20 has the capacity to do that to your heart. Money can deeply affect our hearts. Let me ask you a question. Does money have any control over you? Over time, I realized that I like nice things, but I didn't need them to be happy. I wasn't a person who was chasing after the almighty dollar, but I did, I did come to realize I liked to eat. I wanted to be sure that my wife and my kids were able to eat as well. And I preferred, I was just one of those people, I preferred sleeping indoors as opposed to outdoors. And to do these kinds of things, it takes money, doesn't it? I also understood that it's easy to get carried away when spending, and on a few occasions, I've overspent on myself. Eventually, I learned, though, that living generously, living a life that is generous, you know, where you're giving to help people or to invest in causes that were important to me, that was actually more rewarding than spending money on myself. That was a really important day when I came to that understanding. But living generously isn't easy. In fact, living generously is challenging. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I recently read about a conversation that an executive, uh, that was had with an executive of Silicon Valley. This guy was involved with the Forbes magazine fall issue where they would list the top 50 wealthiest people in the United States. He shared that the person who was listed as number 51 on this list actually wrote an eight-page letter explaining why he should have been on the list. It's amazing. But the the Silicon Valley executive said, the list isn't about money. It's about power. It's about prestige. Wealth can buy you significance. 
And the accumulation of things is all about comparison, ego, and power. Appreciate his honesty. All of this, all of this can give money power, which leads many people to fall in love with money, which makes living generously very challenging, especially in the culture we live in today. So how do you defeat generosity's number one enemy? How do we win this insidious battle with the love of money? How do you develop a lasting lifestyle of generosity? Have you ever been generous? Have you ever actually done something generous? Probably most of us have. What was the result? You've probably experienced generosity when you have given something. Something, maybe it was monetary, maybe it was a possession, but you gave something to somebody and God's blessing flowed back to you. And when that happens, there is a, there is a reaction that we experience. It's something the world would pay thousands and, and, and in some cases millions of dollars to experience. It's joy. It's actual satisfaction, contentment in your soul. So in order to live a life where that's the end result, to defeat the love of money, in order to be generous like that, you have to do two things. I want to talk about those just briefly. The first one is stop chasing the wind. Stop chasing the wind. If you have your Bible or your uh, mobile device, you want to follow along, Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter. It's an Old Testament book. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We're going to start with verse 10 through 15. Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes. We talked about him last week. He also wrote several chapters in the book of Proverbs. And he was, as we mentioned last week, considered the wisest man and the richest man ever to live. The book of Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon at the end of his life. It was actually written after he'd accumulated all of his wealth and built all of his buildings. He had over 700 concubines. These were sexual partners. He had over 300 wives. And he had fallen away from God through the influences of these pagan worship rituals that his wives brought into his kingdom. And here's a man who had it all, did it all, tried it all, had unlimited power, unlimited pleasure. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, he says he withheld nothing from himself. He tasted all of life. You name it, Solomon did it. Chasing after the wind was a common phrase that Solomon used throughout Ecclesiastes when he referred to how something was just plain meaningless. It's as meaningless as chasing after the wind, he would say. And toward the end of his life, empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit, he does a lot of evaluation, some of it's self-evaluation. And he looks at everything on this earth and he asks, how do you make sense of this life? He shares the wisdom he learned through all these extravagant life experiences and he gives us his wisdom about money and possessions. And in Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter, verses 10 through 15, Solomon reveals that chase, what chasing after the wind actually looks like. And he points out several problems that grow out of this love for money. And we're going to take just a moment to look at these things. The first one, the first problem is the more you have, the more you want. The more you have, the more you want. Look at Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter. The very first part of verse 10 says, Whoever loves money never has enough. Translation, The more you have, the more you want. Now, the Nizam of Hyderabad, it's actually a real title of a person. He was believed to be the richest man in the world during the 1940s. They estimated his net worth, his fortune, at $236 billion if you adjust it for inflation. The Nizam of Hyderabad As rich as he was, he was also considered to be an outrageously miserly person. He wore tattered clothing. He wore an old fez, which was an Indian-type hat. And he would roll his own cigarettes. He could have paid people to roll his cigarettes. That's their only job. He could have, but he insisted on saving the money. 
when he died, they went into the rooms where all of his wealth had been secured, and they found stacks and stacks of currency that had been eaten by rats. Ironic, isn't it? Solomon would say that's chasing after the wind. The more you have, the more you want. Well, there's another problem that Solomon points out. The more you have, the less satisfied you are. Look what he says at the end of verse 10. He says, whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Boston College has what they call the center of wealth and philanthropy. And for a number of years, they have been surveying 165 households that average, their average net worth of these 165 households The average net worth is $78 million. These are the uber rich. And they ask questions of these people like, how would you describe the ultimate goal? Or how would you describe your deepest aspirations for life? The Atlantic Weekly wrote a summary article of this study, which stated, and I want to just read just a portion of it to you. If anything, the rich stare into the abyss a bit more starkly than the rest of us. The truly wealthy know the appetites for material indulgences are rarely satiated by such things. No yacht is so super, nor any wine so exquisite, that it can soothe the soul. Atlantic Weekly points out, the more you have, the less satisfied you are. Or the reality that you realize this stuff can't bring satisfaction. There's a third problem that Solomon points out, and that is the more you have, the more others will come after your money. (laughs) It's what keeps us connected to our kids, right? I'm just kidding. J.D. Rockefeller, one of the wealthiest men at at that time in the world, said, I have made millions, but they have brought me no happiness. And there are lots of reasons why this is probably true, but one of those is those who try to take away what you have made. You question that, win the lottery, and see who shows up. You'll be surprised, or maybe you won't. This is what Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 5.11. He says, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? What good is that to you? You just get to see them consume your stuff. There's a fourth problem. The more you have, the more you have to worry about. Is that true? You bet. Andrew Carnegie, an equally wealthy man, wrote, Millionaires rarely smile. You can think about that for a while. Ecclesiastes 5.12, Solomon gives us insight into why that's true. The sleep of a laborer is sweet, he says, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Why is that? They're worrying. Solomon says that if you're trying to find meaning in life by accumulating a mass of wealth, you may find it hard to sleep because you're worrying about your possessions. And the more you have, the more you have to worry about. William Henry Vanderbilt, also a wealthy man, was quoted as saying, the care of two million is enough to kill anyone. There is no pleasure in it, which many of us in here would respond to that as, hey, give me a couple months. Let me see what that's like, right? Problem number five, the more you have, the greater the harm in keeping it to yourself. Ecclesiastes 5.13, this is what Solomon writes. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun. What is that evil? He says, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. Wealth is devious. It has power. It's not neutral. It takes a tremendous maturity to handle wealth in a godly way. John Jacob Astor said, I am the most miserable miserable man on the earth. And he was one of the wealthiest men at that time. Problem number six. The more you have, the more you have to lose. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 5.14, Wealth lost through some misfortune. The more you have, the more you have to lose, however you lose it. 
He goes on in verse 15. Look what he says. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb. And as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. You brought nothing into this world, you're going to take nothing out. At least nothing that you can carry in your hands. In 2001, PBS, Public Broadcasting Services, did a TV special called Affluenza, which addressed the modern-day plague known as materialism. Their research that they shared claimed that the average American shops six hours a week. Does that sound about right? Six hours a week. They also said that the average American, the average uh, consumer in America, spends about 40 minutes a week playing with their kids. By age 20, they said all of us have seen at least one million television commercials. More Americans declared bankruptcy in 2001 than graduated from college, they said. And in 90% of divorce cases, arguments about money played a prominent role. The program didn't argue against materialism on a moral basis. They argued about Material, against materialism on a pragmatic basis. Material wealth does not have the power, according to PBS, to bring happiness into a person's life. Solomon, I think, would just nod and say, yep, that's true. It's just chasing after the wind. Now let me pause just for a minute here as we talk about the love of money. Some of you may do the math and you get the problem wrong. Solomon is not saying that wealth in itself is wrong. The Bible doesn't condemn having a lot. Actually, Moses had a lot. Uh, Abraham was rich. David had a ton. Job had tons and tons. In fact, Barnabas, famous guy in the book of Acts, he was a wealthy real estate developer in Cyprus. And you may not know this, but there was a group of financially wealthy women who actually financed the ministry of Jesus. If you think that I'm saying that wealth is bad or wrong, you've missed my point. What the Bible does say, though, is refuse to chase after the wind. The desire for wealth to give you significance and security and value and prominence and the desire to impress others or to gain anything of value for yourself through wealth alone is an empty pursuit. That is chasing after the wind, and that is what the Bible talks about. Now, most of us in this room, you've probably heard this before, but most of us here today are wealthy by the world standards. And since you know now that you're wealthy, it's important to take note of the fact that it takes a significant amount of maturity to be wealthy and godly at the same time. But it can be done. There are people who do it around here all the time. And if you want to be wealthy and godly at the same time, there's a few things that you're going to need to do. The first is you must be a person of the Word of God. You must be a person who's in the Bible on a daily basis. You need to be a person of prayer, a person living in community where people actually know you and hold you accountable for your finances, and a person who shares from their heart. You're generous. In fact, on certain occasions, you're a person who lives with energized generosity. We'll talk about that in a little bit. To be wealthy and to be godly at the same time, it's going to take some effort. God is not against wealth. He's not against wealthy people either. God is against us chasing wealth, looking to find fulfillment in it. If we're going to win the battle with loving money, we must refuse to chase after the win. We must refuse to chase after all those meaningless promises that money can never deliver. The second thing we need to do in order to defeat generosity's number one enemy, the love of money, is refuse to see generosity as depriving yourself. 
Some people think that there's only so much to go around, and if I give some of what I have away, then I'm going to end up having less, or in some cases, not enough. There's only so much, and there's this, just this little piece that's called my piece of the pie. And if you know me, I love pie. So I don't want to give away any of my pie because if it's gone, I might not be able to get it back again. That's not a biblical mindset. It's just not. In fact, life in the kingdom of God actually multiplies. If I give it away, what I have, or at least a portion of it, God will multiply what remains and make it go further. Someone would say, if you give God 10% or you give him 20%, he will do more with the remaining 90 or 80% than what you would have done with the beginning 100%. If I give away what I have, God will multiply it. I can never outgive God. If you hear only one thing this morning, hear that. You will never outgive God. I had a lady come up to me after the first service and she said, Thanks for talking about this. She said, This literally changed our lives as a couple several years ago when we heard this. She goes, We're never the same. And they are some of the most generous people in this church. It's amazing. God just unleashes it. Listen to what Jesus has to say about this. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 20, he says, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Jesus gives a directive here, but it isn't about depriving yourself so that he can get your money. Instead, it's about doing what is wise. You may miss out on some things here in this lifetime, but you will gain a whole lot more as you store up treasures in eternity. How we live now determines our future. According to Jesus, if I put my focus on earthly treasure, I end up leaving it all behind when I die. But I can instead send my treasure ahead and gain an eternal reward. So, if living with energized generosity means storing up treasures in heaven, then the fundamental question is, how do we do that? How do we live with energized generosity? Let me give you two steps. The first one is this. Never forget, always, always, always remember where your true home is. Never forget that. Heaven is my home. Heaven is every believer's home. We're just visiting earth. Even though life here is temporary, though, this is important, we are meant to enjoy it. We're supposed to enjoy this life. God's not asking you to live in abstract poverty. He's not called you to do that. Now, that may be part of the journey of life, but you will find joy and meaning in every step of the journey if you're walking with God. Enjoying this life might mean that you have a good steak every once in a while, or you go on vacation with your family. It might mean that you save some money so that you're prepared in the event of an unforeseen you know, uh, catastrophe financially, or you give some away because of the feeling that you get, or for some of you, it means you Do something radically generous where you give something and no one knows about it and you just change the trajectory of a person or an organization. All of this is rooted in a specific way of thinking that is tied to where we're from, where our home is. Our home is in heaven. That's where we're from. Listen to what Paul says about it in Philippians 3.20. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Never, ever forget who you are and where you're from. And live like the citizen of heaven that you are. The second step we need to take to live with energized generosity is simply take action to be generous. 
Let me put it simply. Do something generous. I mean, we can all agree in here that generosity is a good thing. We can all agree on that in principle. But here's the reality. It doesn't mean much unless we go out and actually be generous, right? Paul gave a lot of insight into this. Let me, let me back up before we get to that. If you want to be generous, let me give you two action steps, okay? The first one is this. If you've never done this, begin investing in the kingdom of God by giving a tithe. Now, I'll explain the tithe here in a minute, but begin investing in kingdom initiatives. And the tithe is just a measurement, all right? Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter. Verses 1 and 2, he says, Now about the collection for the Lord's people. He was taking up an offering for the poor, all right? He says, Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Paul's saying, Set aside some money every week. If you haven't done that, you've never done that before, or you haven't already started taking God at his word when it comes to giving, I want to invite you to do that today. I want, you, I want to invite you to start investing in this thing we call the kingdom of God so that we can fuel this engine to push this thing forward. Now, here's the, here's the crazy thought about this. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need my money. But he invites us to invest in it, and the, the return on that investment is eternal. There'll be people in heaven someday because of the investments that we make today. How cool is that? Now, here's, the, here's an important reality. The devil's going to try to convince you to do otherwise. Don't be deceived by it. In fact, some of you, automatically, he's started bombarding you, and you're shutting down going, oh, this is all about money again. It's not. Trust me. Now, one of the things that I want to make sure that you recognize is that God honors generosity. It doesn't always happen in a monetary way, but it never goes without his blessing. And we've tried to make it as convenient as possible here. We take cash and checks, just like everybody, okay? But we have tried, we've tried with the online giving app to make it even easier. So you can go to the website, click on our main page, click on the giving tab, follow the prompts. You can start giving online today. In fact, uh, our family, I think all of, our, all of my kids, my wife and I, all of us do that. You can even utilize the reoccurring giving feature that is available to you, and it will help you to give faithfully. Even if you're not very faithful, it will help you to be more faithful. Okay? And let me just say this. We appreciate that. You know? You go, oh, I forgot. Oh, okay, we won't pay the youth minister this week. <laughs> you know? I'm okay with that. But, I mean, you know, uh, he's not. He's not. They just had a baby. So here's the deal. Start investing in the kingdom. All right? Now, 10%. 10% is a measurement we use in Scripture. We could talk about, we talk about that a lot around here. But some of you may look at that and you go, 10% of what? 10% of what you earned that week. That, that was the, kind of the benchmark. And some of you go, there's no way. I can't, I mean, I can't do that. Okay, pick a percentage that you can. 5%, 2%, start somewhere. Don't go, I can't do 10%. I'm not supporting the kingdom of God, <laughs> you know, okay? That's a really bad idea. Hey, get on the team. 2%, 3%. Start somewhere with the intent to get to 10%. And watch what God does with the remaining 90%. It'll be amazing. Make this Sunday the day that you take that first bold step of faith and follow God with your finances. Uh, I'm not challenging you. I want to invite you to be part of it. The second action step that I want to encourage you to take is take a step of energized generosity. You're not going to find that term anywhere. I just invented it over the course of this series. Energized generosity is my idea or my picture of what a significant gift is, something that goes beyond your regular giving. It's something you can't do all the time because you just don't have the resources to do it, but it's something that you do occasionally, and it really makes a huge difference. 
And I want to ask you, I think there are lots of places all around the world where you can make significant, energized, generous investments. And I want to challenge you to do that two or three times a year. Some of you, you have high capacity. You could do it every month. And there are a select few in here who could do it every single week. You could change the trajectory of someone or an organization's life with a, with a significant, energized, generous gift. And I want to ask you to do that. In fact, I want to tell you about something that's going to happen here in June. And I know you're not going to believe me when I say this, but I set out with these two weeks to talk about generosity. And what I'm about to tell you right now didn't, was not part of the agenda. But God has brought it to my attention, and I feel like it fits right here. I want to talk to you about something that's going to start on June the 3rd. It's called All Together. Something that this Northeast family is going to do. It's called All Together, Four Weeks of Generosity. And what we're going to do is take a four-week special offering for a couple of capital improvements that we need to make. You know, it's been awesome for me to see God at work here and to see growth happening especially over the last three years. It's just been amazing. And those of you that have been here for four, five, six years, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This has been so exciting to see God unleashed in this, in this body of believers. But one area that over the course of this growth has not kept pace has been our giving. As a result, our giving's been good and it's grown, but it hasn't kept pace with the growth. And as a result, our budgeted weekly need has stayed the same for three years, just right at 29000 Now, you can imagine the cost of maintaining a facility this size and funding all the ministries, and our staff salaries are actually low, much lower than the national average. But over the, two, over the last two, few years, there are two systems that have been in need of some serious attention. One is the roof over the gym, and the other is our HVAC system, which provides the heating and air conditioning for our entire facility. With very little discretionary funds available to us over the last few years, we've been on, only able to do what has been absolutely necessary to keep these two systems afloat. We've been patching the roof and band-aiding the HVAC for several years now. But we've reached a critical point in our journey with these two things, and we need to make some significant repairs before catastrophic events can happen. For instance, with the HVAC, it's only operating at 50% capacity. Now, if it goes down tomorrow, we'll sweat a little in here, but we'll be fine. But if it goes down in December, we'll have pipes breaking in a variety of places around this facility, and that is catastrophic. The gym roof, it is a 10-year warrantied roof that happens to be in its 18th year. <laughs> We're geniuses sometimes, aren't we? I mean, God has been so faithful to keep that roof in one place. But as a result, you can tell, it needs repaired. The total cost of these two, I'm going to do some math for you. The HVC is 43000 That's round numbers. And the roof, 59000 Do the math in my head, 102000 Why bother? Well, because to not do anything would be irresponsible and it would lead to even greater cost. This building is an incredible tool that God has provided for us to use to accomplish his purposes. This is not where we get our identity. It is just a tool, and we're grateful for it, but we have to be good stewards of it. Every Sunday, you will see pictures just like this all around. This is, this is one of the early childhood rooms. This is last Sunday. It's a panoramic picture that somebody took. There are four caregivers in there and 12 little walkers, toddlers. These, <laughs> these people were probably medicated later, but the, uh, this is not uncommon. This happens over there and over there and parts of this building all every Sunday. This is, a, this is a phenomenal thing to happen. That's why we do this. 
On March the 24th, we had our Easter treasure hunt. And this is like the third or fourth, maybe fifth year in a row where the weather was terrible. We couldn't have it outside. But we had a facility where we could do it inside. And we had hundreds of kids all over. This is just one-third of them in the gym. There were two other areas where they were hunting eggs. And this only takes about three minutes, you know. And that stuff was gone. It's a great tool. Every Monday night during the school year, there are over 300 women in this room in Bible study fellowship, studying the Word of God. There is never a bad time for people to study the Bible in a Bible-driven culture. Nearly every day of the week, there are Bible studies and ministry team meetings throughout this complex. And I can't think of a better usage for it than that. But we need to be good stewards, as I mentioned, of this facility, and we need to make these necessary repairs. The bottom line is we're going to need to raise $102,000 above and beyond our regular offering. And that sounds like a lot because it is a lot. Let's be honest. But we serve a faithful God, don't we? He's been so faithful to us through this journey. So to begin with, I just want to ask you to join me, our staff, our elders, in just praying from now to the end of this four weeks of generosity, which will be at the end of June. And just ask God to provide the resources for this offering. This starts on June the, 20, or June the 3rd through the 24th, and we'll be collecting the offering during that time, but I'm not asking for anybody to give anything toward this today or next week. I'm just asking that you would join us in asking God to provide the resources. And then we'll all join in together and we'll see what God does. I think everybody can do something to help meet the needs. William Carey was a famous missionary to India. He said, expect great things from God, attempt great things from God. This kind of stuff isn't easy. Honestly, you can ask Steve Smith or other members of our staff. I don't, this is my least favorite topic to talk about. But the reality is the reason we do all of this is we just don't want anybody to miss out on a relationship with Jesus. We want everybody to make it. We want to increase the population of heaven. So with God's help, we're going to continue to attempt to do great things around here for him. And for us to do that, we're going to have to invest in kingdom efforts. And then we're going to have to go long once in a while with some of these energized, generous gifts. I hope you'll be a partner with us in praying over the course of the next couple weeks. Let's do something great. Let's do something great for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father. I thank you so much for being our provider. James says that you're the giver of every good and perfect gift, and uh, we know, God, that that goes far beyond any monetary blessing or any material blessing. You have blessed us in so many ways, and for that we are grateful. God, I pray that you will guide each one of us to be partners with you in investing in kingdom initiatives, whether they be here or around the world. I pray, God, that you will stretch us and challenge us to see how not just beneficial it might be for us, but just to see how faithful you are and to recognize that we will never outgive you. God, I pray for this need that we have for these capital improvements, and I pray, God, that you will provide for us the specifics that we need. God, I thank you most of all for providing the grace that every one of us needed in order to be part of your family, to have a relationship with you and to have everlasting life be part of our eternity. God, I thank you for the promise of heaven and hope that we have. Lord, I pray for any man, woman, student, child who's in here today that's never taken that step to put their faith in Jesus, that they would do that today. That is the greatest blessing that you have given to us. And I pray no one misses out on it. God, thank you for your generosity toward us. 
may we live as citizens of heaven, exemplifying that generosity to the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and let's worship. If you have a decision on your heart, I'll be down front. I'd love to talk to you, pray with you about it. Let's worship our Lord.